Thiago. Messi. Oh! Messi! From England to Brazil. Germany to Argentina. We got you covered. Welcome to the Throw In. Here are your hosts, Garrett Green, Justin Simmons, and Kit McConico. Now, oh, welcome in to another edition of the Throw In. So glad to have you alongside here in the greatest city in the world, Austin, Texas, on another cloudy morning. We always catch them on Sunday somehow. Glad to have you alongside Garrett Green with Kit McConico, Justin Simmons, and of course our man Zach Christo behind the glass. And uh, not a not a great day for me, guys, as we're we're looking at this Everton Manchester United match that's going on right now. And if I would have told you before the game that Everton would have a three nothing lead seventy five minutes in, you would have said. I would have that, that was it right on. there. <laughs> Nothing. I'm sorry, kid. I, I, that was it. That was like, I still couldn't think of anything to say because I still kind of don't believe it. How can something be so crappy yet so happy at the same time? <laughs> I'm very disappointed. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we're looking forward to hearing Van Gaal's post post game after this. I don't see a four goal effort out of United in the final fifteen. Well, Garrett, I, I think you're looking at this the wrong way. There are going to be some good things that will come of this for United, and and those good things will be the fact that I don't think Ryan Giggs is going to get slapped after this one from Louis Van Gaal. And I think the other more important thing is that, well, this is this is a game that United on paper they should have won, they should have had this, but. Let's be honest, they never showed up. Okay, thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, Gary, you told me that there was some uh, changes to the back line. uh, More importantly, Patrick McNulty, Patrick Patty, Patty McNair, the young 19-year-old Irish boy. Is he the northern Irish guy? guy? He's going to come from the other side. He's he's just for this match. Let's send him back after (laughs) it's done. That's all they're going to do. He's 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 very real. He's going to be back in Limerick at the end of this one. He's looked... (laughs) He's looked terrible. He's looked absolutely. He oh. has looked absolutely worse than Kit's Scottish accent sounds. Um, as, no, that was Kit's Irish accent. There's oh, a difference. Excuse me. There is. <laughs> there is a big there difference. No, there but really like you, is. But like you were saying, though, uh, you told me that he was bad before I even came to see this game. I was like, Gary, he can't be that bad. Oh no, no, it's really that bad. It, How did this guy get stuck playing with the starting eleven? Well, I think that Phil Jones is injured and not everybody is fit. I mean, remember in the match against uh, Manchester. City, Michael Carrick just took himself off the field down the stretch in that match, and I think that he's still injured. Uh, so they're going back to that back four, and of course that's been the problem for United this entire season, even whenever they were in great form over the last month or so before running into Chelsea and now the powerhouse Everton at home. I'm surprised De Gea hasn't taken himself off the field for this one. I'm surprised De Gea hasn't booked a flight back to Madrid. <laughs> I was going to say, by the, end of this, by the end of this one, he's going to be as bald as Tim Howard by the way he's been ripping out his hair. <laughs> and by the way, Tim Howard has been uh, he's been pretty good in goal today, but really United hasn't challenged him that much. I can't say I've taken a look at the stats, but they've only put probably two shots on goal all afternoon. But of course, this isn't the big match today. It's one we're paying attention to. The big match coming up uh, obviously, the matchup of the top two teams in the Premier League, Chelsea taking on Arsenal. And we'll have our preview for that matchup coming up a little bit later. Uh, but guys, obviously, middle of the week this week, we had uh, Champions League that wrapped up. And I went out on uh, Wednesday afternoon to go catch Bayern Munich playing Porto. It was that match that, remember, we didn't give enough credit to the week before. So we said, oh, hey, look, Porto, you know, they've maybe they got a chance in this one. And then I got there after about 25 minutes and... Uh, the match was already over. <laughs> yeah, last week I said that I had to eat some crow saying the Porto wasn't good. I'm actually going to retract that. I, I just got my weeks confused. Um, I was actually just <laughs> thinking one week ahead. I was referring to what was going to be coming the following week, the return leg in Germany, and <laughs> a beatdown of epic proportions by the Bavarians. And you and I in the, same, in the same situation, I showed up to that one about 10 minutes in. And that game, it was well finished, well in the bag. And Credit Bayern. They came out, they knew what they had to do, and they were playing at home. They knew if they were going to advance, they had to really take advantage of the first 15 minutes they did. I mean, Mueller, Lewandowski, you can go through the entire team. But this, it sets up for, I mean, we have four left in Champions League, some great matchups, but Bayern, a lot of people, us included, saying, well, it's not the Bayern of 2013, this is Bayern of... The team I saw last week, the team I saw dismantle Porto, 
as good as anyone in European football. And more importantly, they were still playing without Frank Ribéry, and they were still playing without their best player, Arjen Robben. So, no Scarface and no Dutchman. That's exactly right. Yeah, so can you imagine how powerful that team would be offensively when both of those guys are healthy? Well, and you mentioned the fact how powerful would they be offensively in the second leg of each of their last Champions League matches. They scored seven goals, and then they put six on the board in this last one. So the question is, can Munich play away from home? And it sets up favorably that, by the way, the Champions League final this year is in Berlin. Well, there's no away leg. The Champions League final is one game, so if they can make in the final... In Berlin! <laughs> everything's on their side. If they can make the final, essentially a home game, but they've got to get there first. That's the big question. Well, and it sets up nicely because the other team that advanced with relative ease was Barcelona uh, defeating PSG. PSG, uh, obviously, you know, David Luiz, we said... Before this, uh, before that two-game matchup even got underway, that Luis wasn't set to play. But with Thiago Silva being injured, he was forced into action, and he just didn't look anything like himself in that game. As Falcao finds the back of the net, oh, right. no, 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 he was offside. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no, no, it just no. gets better no. and better for me today. I'm oh, telling you. Oh my gosh. Uh, anyway, well, let's talk about, but let's keep keep our conversation here and the fact that Barcelona. Advanced what, you don't want to talk about the fact that they're not playing good today? No, no, I let's don't. Let's go ahead and rub it in now. I don't. You guys can rub it in after the match is over in the next, like, ten minutes. All right. So, but with Barcelona, they advance with ease. PSG just not really putting up a fight. And, guys, this sets up a really Really nice uh, offensive match. This might be one of the higher scoring games that we've seen uh, out of both teams uh, in this leg. Bayern taking on Barcelona. Oh, I think it's going to be a fantastic matchup. Everybody talking about it. And obviously, Pep Guardiola, the interesting one here. Obvi- the f- previous coach at Barca, now at Bayern. But going back to the Barca PSG game, I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask Eric Cantona, where's the where was the world's best player in that one? Javier Pastore, and I will never. Give it, I will never be overly critical of an Argentine unless they deserve it, but Pastore, I mean, just he was a no-show. A lot of his team was a no-show, and just nothing really from the Parisians in that one, but it sets up a fantastic match. Barca, Bayern, two teams, very high octane. We're going to see a lot of goals in this one, and I think it may come down to the defending and the goalkeeping. If that's the case, give the advantage to the Germans. You really would give the advantage to, to Bayern. Uh, cause, because I, I thought that Barcelona has been playing rather well when it comes to the defense. I mean, if you can shut down Zoltan, I think you're pretty good. And Sergio Busquets, I mean, that guy's no slouch. Granted, Don, Donny Alves and players like that are coming up in age and they're slow. And you, and you still have that weird um, substitution thing going on with Iniesta and Xavi. But there's a reason why um, they're being played like that. It's kind of like a metronome. Iniesta's there to try to lace a good pass for the run and gun, and Xavi is there to basically run the tiki-taka, just making sure that everything... He, he's a really good game manager. He's really good with pacing. And that's why I've noticed that uh, why Barcelona's been so successful. They let Iniesta run all over the place, tried to feed the ball in, and then come the second half, they put in Xavi and let him try to just maintain the rest of the flow. No, I think you're right. And the analogy of a metronome, I think, is very apt for both Xavi and Iniesta. The only thing is, defensively... Bayern has better defense. They have players like Boateng, and sometimes Boateng, much like Danny Alves, forgets he's a defender, but he <laughs> generally gets back. Alves, not always the case. Oh, Alves, you mean like how Brazilian he style. gave that goal away against Porto in that 3-1 first leg? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and these things happen. That being said, obviously, the better goalkeeper is on the side of the Bavarians. Manuel Neuer, one of the best, if not the best in the world. I would say it's probably between him and, well, the ageless wonder there in turn, Mr. Buffon, between oh. the sticks for the old lady. But that being said, Barca, Barca is in a great run of form. They're in a very rich vein right now. They have to score goals. This is not a team that defends. Bayern can score goals. They can defend. I, I think they can play a few different styles. Barca doesn't have that luxury. For me personally, I think it's too close to call. If, if Bayern can get if they can keep the first leg close, they want one one two one ball games. Barca Barca wants they want goal fest. Yeah, and and you have to also remember that Pep Guardiola knows a lot of those players on Barcelona. He he's familiar with their tendencies, and I think when it comes to the managerial part of this game, obviously Bayern is going to have the advantage. Well, and obviously, whenever you take a look at Barcelona, it also helps with the fact that they've been playing such great defense that you can put seven guys back. Uh, and, and really, you only have to worry about letting Neymar, Messi, and Suarez run your counterattack, which has been so incredibly successful for them in both La Liga and Champions League play. Well, that was only a matter of time, and people were giving Suarez a hard time. Well, he hasn't settled, and he hasn't done this. 
that trident, the South American trident, as I refer to it, the Brazilian, the Argentine, and the Uruguayan, they are, they are going on all cylinders right now, doing a great job. And that being said, if they can carry the load, that helps Barca. Barca can drop defensively, put more guys in the defensive third, try to stifle Bayern, but we'll see if that's enough. I'm, my, my fear is that if it's a nil-nil game in the 60th, the 70th minute, Barca starts having to send numbers forward, gives Bayern a huge opportunity in the counter. We know how deadly they are. Byron, if you give them an opportunity, they will find the back of the net. We saw that against Porto. And, and also, you're right. I'm not sure Barca has the legs in the midfield to compete at such a high octane level for that long. That, that, that would be my main concern when it comes to defense for Barca. Well, the depth of the bench is going to come into this for both of them. And I think that being the case, Byron has a deeper bench. Obviously, we mentioned the absence of both Ribery and Ian Robin. Huge absences there. We'll have to see if they'll be able to play in those games against Barcelona. But Barcelona, especially defensively in that defensive midfield, they don't have the depth. They don't have the guys on the bench. You talk about the absence of Puyol. PK's playing very well, mm-hmm. but they need the guy. They need the guy who's tough. Where's Mascherano? That's a great question. That is a wonderful question. He was the question. best defender in the World Cup that I saw, and everybody said it, and it was true. If it wasn't for him, Argentina doesn't get to the final. He very well could be the key for this game for Barcelona. It could depend on how Jefecito Mascherano plays. If he plays well, if he can be the holding midfielder, if he can break up the Bayern attack, if he can send things the other way, Barca could be successful. If he's a no-show, it's going to be a very, very long two legs. Yeah, that's what Barca's hoping for, for him to show up. 512-447-3776 if you want to give us a call or send us a text on the Specs text line at 512-337-3776. Coming up, we'll preview the second half uh, of the other side of Champions League. Uh, you had the other half of Real taking on Atleti, how that one wrapped up. Also, Juventus moving along despite neither team scoring a goal in that second leg. Also, the Austin Aztecs were in action last night. We'll recap that game as Justin and Kit took it in from House Park last night. Uh, and also, of course, the big match of the day, Chelsea taking on Arsenal. All that and more coming here on the throw-in on 104.9 The Horn, where Austin talks sports. Welcome back to the throw-in. Here are the guys from FC Cap City. Oh, welcome back. It is the throw-in here on 104.9 The Horn. A reminder, if you want to go back and catch any of the show that you missed, you can hear it all on SoundCloud. Just search for The Throw-In. Also, you can uh, find where we post the show to YouTube every week. You can find that on our Facebook page, The Throw-In. And uh, Justin, I I have to say I'm a jerk because I haven't gone back and watched them until this past week. Uh, And... Uh, it, trust me, Justin does a great job pu- putting it all together. It's well worth your time to go back and uh, see the funny things that oh, well, Justin slips in there. Uh, it's uh, it's good. It's that was good. nice of you to say, especially <laughs> since United's having such a bad day. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be positive here, optimistic. <laughs> as Manchester United uh, entering stoppage time here, they're down three nothing to Everton. Not something that we expected. Well, a match that uh, is going to be a good one this afternoon. Well, at least we assume it will be between Chelsea and Arsenal coming up just after we wrap up here. And we're now pleased to be joined on the Bob Steak and Chop House Hotline by the president of the Austin Blues. It is Jens Bush joining us. Jens, how are you doing this morning, buddy? Oh, I'm brilliant. Come on, you blues. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so glad uh, that you, you got up just a little bit before the match and you stepped aside from pre-gaming for just a moment to come on with us this morning. Uh, obviously, uh, Chelsea sitting comfortably atop the table. Uh, Arsenal chasing right behind them. They're in third before this match. Uh, what does it mean to Chelsea to... Uh, defeat the Gunners this afternoon uh, in route to what everybody is assuming will be a Premier League title this year? Uh, yes, a great question. Uh, due to the fact that I can't remember when Arsenal ever beat Chelsea, I, I don't know how to <laughs> <laughs> that's That's, uh, that's a, it's a big ask. Um, no, I think it's going to be a, a, a great game. Um, you know, Mourinho's got a Got got a lot of victories over Arsenal, and Didier Drogba has scored like 348 goals against him or something like that. So I think that uh, it should be an exciting game. I, I honestly, if we get man, one point from today, just don't concede a, a, a loss, then that'd be great. But I'm pretty confident. Jens, you and I spoke before the season started, and I seem to be more confident than you were about the Blues. I, I thought they were the favorite heads and tails above everyone yep. else to win the EPL. You weren't so sure, but things seem to have panned out in your way. How do you like the way this Chelsea team has come along this season? 
Well, I love the results. I love the fact that we're top of the league. I don't, I don't like the uh, vilification of Chelsea. There seems to be a lot of hate, but that's okay. Um, Mourinho has a, a style of play that we all know. We've seen him play for many different teams. I'm sure, he managed very many different teams. Um, either you like him or you don't, and whoever he happens to run at the time just kind of get a bad rap. So, but I am very pleased. I mean, you look at some of the talent we have out there right now. Eden Hazard. You know, one of the top players this year, so it's, it's been fun to watch. Jens, you mentioned some of the animosity, the hate, if you will, for Mourinho. I personally think he's a fantastic manager. He takes the pressure off of his players, puts it squarely on his own shoulders, and he does that by baiting the media sometimes, but he really he, he's able to kind of play them like a marionette. Would you agree that he, he, takes, he takes pressure from his players, and that's really what a manager should do? Yeah, honestly, I, I couldn't have said it better myself until I have, I have said that in the past, Kit especially on our board. We get into discussions about Mourinho. Um, he does deflect a lot of the attention to the players onto himself, which does make a, probably a much more relaxed dressing room, and you know, the players can be more together as a team. And I think it's a good tactic, uh, but it you know, puts them in a bad light. But I don't care what, for 18 points clear at the top now or something, I don't remember. Yeah, and talking about players, the uh, PFA announced their starting 11 of the year, six players from Chelsea were on that starting 11. One of them, though, that was missing that I thought would be on there was Cesc Fabregas. Could you probably explain more to maybe the listeners at home what he does for Chelsea that most people don't catch on a regular basis? Uh, well, I think that's a great question. I, actually, I didn't know that. That's ridiculous. Oh, so. I'll tell you real quick. It was Diego Costa, it was Ivanovic, John Terry, Cahill in the back line, and then uh-huh. it was Eden Hazard, obviously, and then there right. was one more player on the wing uh, in the midfield for uh, for Chelsea that got called up to that team. I think I only said five. There's a sixth one. I'll, I'll look it up for you, but that's what okay, we have yeah. right now. Yeah, no, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. If, first off, if you ever see Chelsea play live and not on the television, you get to see a much more broad uh, broadness of the, the pitch, so to speak, so you can see what's going on. His, his, movement off the ball puts him, <clears throat> his movement off the ball puts him in a position to deliver the passes that, you know, score – what, 18 assists this season or something? Absolutely astonishing. Yeah, he, he leads the league feel. either way. Yeah, I mean, he he has a feel for the game. He seems to be the right time, right place, so to speak. He did have a lull for a couple of games. And, you know, that means that, oh, my gosh, something's wrong with him. No, I mean, he cannot be that guy all the time. And also, a lot of the teams have figured out how we play him in a role. So they're, they're getting to the space at the t- same time he's getting to the space. But all in all, just fantastic. I mean, I, I couldn't believe we bought him. It was a national lot. Oh, yeah, we bought Fabregas. What? <laughs> I had no idea uh, that that was even on the book. So he's been an amazing addition and one of the big, big reasons we're sitting top of the league right now. Well, Jens, obviously top of the league. You've got a huge lead, probably the Premier League trophy in hand for this year, going up against the team while they celebrate fourth place like they've won the league, and we all know that going against <laughs> Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal fans saying that, well, they're coming up. They've gotten a lot of flack. They've kept Wenger. And, well, one of the things they always say is, well, we're, we're financially soluble. We're financially soluble. We make money. We're, we're in the black. But that being said, a team that really the only thing they can ever seem to come away with is the FA Cup. Right. Right. Uh, so my comment on Arsenal or, or – oh, yeah, it's, so there's, they're, right, they're on a the form right now is the best in the Prem. I mean, they've gone 20 games in a row with, with uh, not being defeated, I think it is, or something like that. And they are the hottest team right now besides Chelsea. But, you know, they, they play against big teams like us. They sometimes play down. Um, I don't know better way to put it, but I don't think they really play as well as they could, which is fine because they will finish fourth again and celebrate like they won the Prem. Jens, you're a lifelong Chelsea fan, president of the Austin Blues. Tell our listeners a little bit about how you became a fan of the Blues and the Austin Blues, the chapter here in town that's so well-known, well-regarded by Chelsea itself. Well, I was uh, born in Holland back in the early, uh, what, 1910, I think it was, 1911. Ha (laughs) ha. Why don't you have the accent? Uh, Because I was actually raised in London from uh, from 66 to 78, coming from Panama. Uh, my mom was an American, my dad was Danish, and I went to an international school, but all my friends were British. Wow, you're just like a living Benetton ad. <laughs> I know, I, right. So when I got to the United States, I did have an accent, more of like a South African accent, actually. And I wanted to kind of blend in as quickly as I could, so I really didn't want to be in the U.S., unfortunately. Back in the late 70s, I had no choice. 
uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I've, I've come to uh, to love and embrace everything that Austin and, and USA are. The Chelsea, I became a Chelsea fan because I lived on Gloucester Road, and basically, if you head a little southwest of Gloucester Road for about 15 minutes, you'll walk right into Stamford Bridge. So my dad was a Chelsea fan, season ticket holder, his first game it was in '66, I think it was. I was about seven, and uh, loved it. Came to the United States in 1977. There was no such thing as football here, apart from the throwball stuff. Oh, handbag. Uh, yeah, handbag, right? So we started, <laughs> finally showed out. You know, the television started showing it. Sado started showing it, and I went in there, found a couple other people who liked Chelsea, which I was amazed at, and gathered them up. Started getting emails and just did a hardcore campaign of getting everybody together, and we morphed into a, a huge club, officially recognized by Chelsea. Our banner is at the bridge every single game. It's really quite phenomenal how it all just kind of transpired. But but it's great. A lot of other soccer supporter clubs are, are coming up now. I think we had a little bit of influence in getting the momentum point for other people to do it, and it just makes for a, a better understanding of the game. And even when we're trying to get the Aztecs here. You know, or an MLS team or something like that here, it helps having a community that's aware of, it, of the game. Speaking with Jens Bush, founder and president of the Austin Blues, the official Chelsea supporters group of the Blues here in Austin. Jens, talk to us a little bit about the growth that you've seen in soccer here in the USA. You mentioned when you first moved here over 30 years ago, soccer really didn't exist, and now the game just exploding. It seems to be getting bigger by the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, two things, you know, television is absolutely what happened to make the game more across all, all lines of uh, kids, girls, and boys, and women. Um, a lot of it also has to do with, uh, you know, the game being played more than it ever has been. And you know, when I first got here in 77, I actually was the president of the Austin Men's Soccer Association for about 10 years. And there were, we only had about three leagues when we started it off. And then I think now they got something like seven or eight or some a huge number. But a lot of it came specifically from being able to get access to the game live on TV. Uh, when I first coached teams here, you put the ball down, all, all the kids, all 22 of them, would jump on the ball and move around like a big armadillo. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, you could, you, can, you could play back there. And then, oh, so then everybody got into formations, you know, and then the guys would not move until the ball came to them. And, well, I can't score because I'm a right back. Like, no, actually, there's some great right backs that score. So having them watch the game and see how the game flows, they get the game in their head more. That's, that's been huge, I think, for us. And also the USA team doing well. Well, well, anyway. So, yeah, it's, it's, I'm an England fan, so don't you know. Don't tell <laughs> well, Jens, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Before we let you go really quick, uh, let people know out there how they can get involved with the Chelsea Blues here in Austin uh, if they want to come out and find out about it. Sure. We, are, we watch all, all the games, which are probably the Haymaker, which is... Oh, no. Ah, uh, oh, so close. Anyway, uh, I believe he was going to say they watch all the matches over at Haymaker over there in East Austin. And, uh, Kit, do you know their website that they have? I believe it is just Austin Blues, but you can check that out. I know they have a Facebook page. They also, I believe they have a, web- they have a website as well. But Austin Blues, in all the games they watch at Haymaker, they will be getting ready for this one just over 30 minutes away from the kickoff and ready to wrap their hands around the EPL trophy. We'll go ahead and step aside for a quick moment. Whenever we come back, we'll make sure that we have that website for you because we hate that Yens got cut off. Again, a big thanks to Yens Bush, uh, president of the Chelsea Blues, for joining us. Uh, we'll go ahead and get back into... Uh, a little bit of Champions League talk. Austin Aztecs played last night. Also, we'll give you a little bit more of a preview for this Chelsea and uh, excuse me, Arsenal match that we have coming up here on the Throw-In on 104.9 The Horn, where Austin talks sports. If you ever get a chance to go to another country, see sports, because it's totally... There's no hatred like international hatred, everybody. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mean political hatred. I mean sports hatred, you know? All our sports over here are only 150, 160 years old, you know? I was, I was in an England versus Germany soccer game. That goes back 1,800 years, everybody. That goes back to beheading the king, putting it on the stick, peeing on it, sitting it on fire, and running the damn thing through town. Right, so go Yankees doesn't really measure up after that. Welcome back to the throw in. Here are the guys from FC Cap City. Oh, welcome back. It is the throw in here on 1049 The Horn on a 
Very British day outside. It's raining just out of our outside of our studio here at 360 NB Caves. Uh, uh, Zach, I think we have a little bit of breaking news. Getting ready for this Arsenal Chelsea game, guys. It's uh, it's raining in England. Absolutely, fan. It just it's it's, amazing. There, yeah. Breaking news. Oh, it looks like England outside here. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, and uh, it just matches my misery as it's gone final. Uh, Manchester United has uh, lost to Everton. Three to nothing in an embarrassing, embarrassing showing by the back line for United. You think this was the homecoming that Fellaini and Rooney were looking forward to oh. going back to Goodison Park? Having oh, yeah. nice memories and all, all the good times they oh, hung yeah. out there. Absolutely. You know, Rooney, the, the Everton boy who has gone on to great success at Manchester United, not not lately, obviously, uh, but actually Rooney leaving, icing his knee. Uh, towards the end of the match, uh, I don't know if that was more for his pride or for his actual knee being injured, but uh, Robin Van Persie finding his way into the match. But his hair looked good, Rooney's. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, the, the plugs are filling in nicely. That middle part of his hair that was really receding, is uh, it's nice and thick now. So. Well, I that, think yeah, Colleen's got to be pretty happy with yeah. that. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. They might have lost the match, but they won the hair battle. I mean, you cannot compete with Fellaini. That, that, that fro that he has is just very noticeable. You have to wonder, does that help or hurt with his headers? Imagine it lets him get a little bit of extra force behind the ball because he's got a nice cushion. He needs to figure out how to it. trap it there and just run with the ball on top of his head like he's carrying it as a basket. If he could figure <laughs> that out, that would be brilliant. Well, it was, I mean, let's be honest, in the middle part of the season, United's offense, you could say, was hit it to the back post and Fellaini will go up. He's taller than everybody else and will head it in. That was how they got so far in the FA Cup. Uh, and it also worked pretty well against Manchester City a couple of weeks ago. But that, the last time that United came away with a win after they lose one nothing to Chelsea and now lose 3 nothing to Everton. Well, the English national team has tried to go with tall strikers in the past, Andy Carroll, Eric Crouch, and it just never uh, Peter Crouch, excuse me, and it just never works out well. So, it is kind of odd to see that the fact that Fellaini can be such a such a danger on the ball especially in the air because we've seen other tall guys not be able to 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 play at that level for that long of a period of time. Maybe English should think about trying to nationalize Fellaini. Really? If they can get him to play <laughs> for the uh, two and a half Lions instead of the chocolate makers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any way that he's leaving them. 512-447-3776 if you want to give us a call. Or 512-337-3776 on the Specs text line if you want to shoot us a text and let us know what you're thinking this morning. And guys, now it's time to go around the world. It's time to go around the world. Thank you, voiceover guy, and we will start in the Champions, Champions League. Champions League. Uh, and guys, we were talking about it earlier before we had Jens Bush on again. A big thanks to him for joining us. The other matches that uh, occurred were Atleti taking on Real, and guys, we had a Chicharito sighting. He oh. showed up. Oh, I thought we had like a little soundbite for that, so I, <laughs> so I stayed quiet because I was going to be it's going to be like Chicharito. Da, 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 da. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was a beautiful. I mean, it was all Ronaldo on that goal. I mean, he's the guy that ran through the defense. He's the one that laid off that pretty pass. Chicharito just stood there and just kind of went boop, and that was it. I couldn't agree more. Si se puede. Good, good for Chicharito, but the response of Chicharito coming back, eh, it's a little overblown. He got the goal. They advanced going against the 10-man Atleti side. And, well, disappointed for Cholo Simeone and his team. They really had Real Madrid's number. I had a feeling, though, when it came to a big Champions League match that Real would just figure out a way, and they did at the very end. But, again, courtesy Ronaldo, he was the man who made it happen. All Chicharito had to do was redirect it. Yeah, and Ronaldo had some other attempts on goal that he just happened to miss wide, which for Ronaldo, pretty uncharacteristic. But, hey, he he came through when it mattered most. But I think... I think you might agree with this. Maybe Simeone played the game a little too conservatively. They didn't exactly park the bus, but I mean, they never got anything going up front. Antoine Griezmann, I think, had like maybe one good shot on target, but that was about it. Yeah, Griezmann didn't play well, neither did Mandzukic. I, I, I'm pretty sure Simeone, he was very happy for this game to go to extra time. He was happy with the nil-nil scoreline, but playing down a man that eventually came back to bite him. And all you need is one deft touch. Chicharito had it, enough to send Real Madrid through and uh, make one country to the south of us very happy. And, uh, you know, it's just an absolute heartbreaker for Atleti after they fall to Real in the Champions League final last season. They don't lose to them 
all year. Seven times. In seven different matches that they have. And then in the Champions League, uh, they fall yet again. And Real advances on. But and- huge props to that goalkeeper, though, for Atleti. I mean, he was amazing. There was, there was That game could have easily been 2-0, 3-0. But he kept them in until the very end. Yeah, the 22-year-old Cellini and Oblak, a fantastic in both home and away yeah. leg. And that one in. Well, that young man, I have a feeling he uh, he may have, may have made himself some money in those two games. He's definitely going to be the number one coming coming soon because he's not the number one right now for Atleti. He's the only reason he's playing is due to injury. But I think he's making a strong case. Either he's going to be the number one at Atleti or he's going to be making some big money somewhere else. Sorry about that, Garrett. Didn't mean to no, that's off fine. Everybody. No, maybe he could come to Manchester United after David De- after David De Gea makes his move to <laughs> Real Madrid. That's uh, inevitably coming, and I am dreading that day. Hey, those Chelsea fans are scared that maybe Eden Hazard might be joining him too. So <laughs> we'll you never see. know. Well, uh, the other matchup in the Champions League was uh, Juventus. They get past Monaco. Uh, a nil-nil draw, but Juve obviously with the goal in the first leg. Uh, just a classic defensive matchup here. That's Italian Caccio as finest, baby. <laughs> that means soccer for you guys that don't speak the Italia. But yeah, they just had to sit there. They let Tevez and Vidal make a couple of runs and try to put something on goal, but they really weren't much of a threat in scoring. And they're okay with that because they got the immortal Jean-Luigi Buffon uh, you know, goaltending. Yeah, call it Catanaccio, call it parking the bus, whatever language, whatever term you want to use. But I knew it was coming, and I thankfully did not waste two hours of my life watching that <laughs> match. I'm glad Juve advanced, but that being said, boring. Yeah, it was unfortunate because on Tuesday, both matchups were over 30 minutes into the match. And then on Wednesday, you had to wait all the way until the, what, 100 and something minute in the Real Athletic match, and then there were no goals in the Monaco and Juve match. So those teams going against each other, though, do you think Juve has a chance against Real Madrid? Considering the injuries right now, we're not sure when or if Benzema and Bale will be back for the BBC up front for Real Madrid. I, absolutely. I think these are two great matchups, Bayern and Barca, Juve, Juve and against Real Two, uh, referring to Juve Real, I think these are two teams. They play similar. Real, they want to score more. Juve, they're they're content with the one zero, the two one, something like that. But they they can defend. And they can defend. If if Bale's not there, if Benzema's not there, well, all the pressure goes on Ronaldo. He was able to get him past Atleti. I don't know if he's going to be able to do the same against a team that is much better defensively. You in know, my opinion. And, and, and sorry about that, but I also forget about James Rodriguez. Yeah, I was he's been say. playing well. Yeah, replacing Bale with James Rodriguez is not that much of a drop not, off. Not, not, not t- such a terrible fate to have if you're if you're Real. No, but two very different players. James plays in the middle. He's he doesn't have the pace that Bale does. He's not the threat that Bale is to really get things going. Don't get me wrong; he's a fantastic player, but he doesn't give that X factor. Doesn't give the speed, and that's something that Real is going to need against a team like Juventus, a team that's going to put six, seven guys back defensively and say we have a wall. See if you can break it. Yeah, and if Benzema and Bale aren't playing, you know that Chicharito is going to be in the starting eleven again if, if those two players are injured. And the problem with Chicharito, the reason he is not an everyday player, is because he's inconsistent. We haven't seen consistency from him when he's at United. We haven't seen consistency from him at any level. The only thing I can tell you for sure is that the Mexican Federacionale is very happy with the fact that he scored that goal because that means he can sell some more jerseys. Well, uh, it should be riveting, uh, those two matchups that we have, obviously, coming up, I think, on May 6th, so we'll get more into that next week. All right, guys, uh, the other Champions League that we had going on this week was uh, CONCACAF Champions League, and, man, I'll tell you what, we were talking about what kind of a chance Montreal had going into the Azteca. Uh, They get a goal relatively early in the game, and they didn't necessarily park the bus in the second half. They had some counters but really did a good job to stem uh, Club America, or Club America, I suppose I should say. Yay. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, there's my Spanish for the day. That's uh, improvement, man. Yeah, it is, but not by much. Uh, but then in the 88th minute, an inexplicable foul just outside of the 18-yard box, right along uh, the back line. So it's essentially like giving Club America a corner from 18 yards out and... Uh, America able to equalize a 1-1 draw that really, you, 
you look at Montreal and you say, well, they come away from going to the Azteca with a 1-1 draw. That's all you could ask for. But really, they should have a one nothing lead going back home for the return leg. No, you're exactly right. They have the opportunity to get the victory, to get the clean sheet, to go back home to Montreal to the Big O coming up this week. That being said, 1-1 in the Estadio Azteca, a full Estadio Azteca against the Giants of Liga MAX Club America. It's a fine result. They'll take it. No one, no one saw Montreal going this far. The question is... Can they find a way to win the home leg? Can they defeat Club América? And can they be champions of CONCACAF? Impact de Montreal, they are a horrible MLS team. But for some reason, like we, I, like we stated many times on their run to the final here in the CONCACAF Champions League, they are the luckiest team in Champions League, CONCACAF Champions League. Luck or destiny, I ask you, my friend. You know, I do believe in serendipity, so maybe this maybe this is meant to happen. They'd be the first ever Canadian team to win the CONCACAF Champions League. Club America looking for their first Champions League win since, I think, 2006. But Montreal is the type of team that's come away with 3-3 draws when they needed to. Or they luck into like a 1-0 uh, scoreline where they actually come away with a win. Or they just defend well enough where they lose... Uh, nil one and they still advance so there's just something special about this team and the big O in Montreal is going to be sold out there's going to be 57,000 strong impact fans ready to cheer on their side it should be a fantastic contest in the second leg yeah, speaking of Mexican football one of the greats of Mexican football finally retiring after winning the Copa MX and Garrett I'm going to let you go ahead and pronounce his name yeah. uh no. That would be uh, Cuauhtémoc Blanco, the famous goal scorer. Monte, the famous Monte man. Blanco? Exactly. There you go. Right, there you go. Well There's put. a C in there. Oh. Uh, Temoc giving up his football career, going into politics, and going out on a high note, winning the Copa MX with Puebla. And, well, cheers to him. The bane of a lot of red, white, and blue fans' existence. Very happy to see him pass quietly into retirement. Yeah, Gary, I know you don't know too much about the man, but let me tell you, he's a living Mexican legend. When he was playing MLS, he was the heart and soul of the Chicago Fire. That guy, he he has no pace. The guy can barely move. He looked like he's been 60 years old since he was 21, but he has the prettiest pass, and he's so light on his feet. You know that move where they put the ball in between your legs, and you, or in between your ankles, and you jump up with it and try to, to uh, get past the defender? He's mm-hmm. the guy who basically... Not uh, really popularized the move. Every time you see little kids do that, you can thank Contecmo. Same way that Derek Jeter popular uh, was the you know kind of the first person to do the jump throw from short. I thought you were going to say giving gift baskets to women. That, oh, well, yeah, that's, I was like, that's a completely different and thing. And also having a basket at the front of your house where everybody drops off all of their electronic devices whenever they come in. There's a reason he's never gotten in trouble. Is this true? That's exactly. <laughs> Lastly, in Around the World, moving down to South America... River Plate, my favorite team, qualifies by the skin of their teeth for the knockout round of the Copa Libertadores. And, well, who do they draw? Their eternal rivals, Boca Juniors, what? Boca oh, man. and River going at it. They will play each other three Super Classicos in less than a week and a half coming up <laughs> May the 3rd, 7th, and 15th, I believe. Are these so, games home and away and then neutral, or how is this going to work? Well, the Libertadores games will be home and away. The first one will be at El Monumental, River's House. The second at La Bombonera, Boca. But the game, the first one is started off. That will be a league game in the Primera División in Argentina. Okay. So, uh, fans, they will get three opportunities to see what the Guardian ranked as the single greatest event in all of sports. Have you been to one of those, Kit? I've been to Boca River at River and at Boca. When the the game I went to at Boca, I wore an Argentine jersey and was very quiet. Did not did, did not make noise. And quite frankly, I was uh, I was I was quite was quite quite afraid. I'm <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. were, folks. Well, have you never seen Kit? He's like six foot six, and that means he's a big target for those guys if he's wearing the wrong color jersey. Yeah, and well, you do not want to be wearing the wrong color jersey anywhere in South America. We unfortunately don't have more time to get into it, but Kit, next week you'll have to give us a recap of how all that wraps up and also give us a little more of a background on the stadium. That is how we go around the world. We'll go ahead and step aside for just a moment when we come back. The Austin Aztecs were in action last night. We'll recap what happened with them. Also, we'll see if we can maybe check in with our friends at the Austin Gunners and see how they're feeling as we get ready for Chelsea and Arsenal. Also, our matches of the week. All that and more as we wrap things up here on the throw-in on 104.9 The Horn, where Austin talks sports. Welcome back to the throw-in. Here are the guys from FC Cap City. Drive, drive, drive. 
Oh, welcome back to the throw-in here on 104.9 The Horn. If you want to get in touch with us, you can send us a text on the Specs text line, 512-337-3776. A reminder that if you missed any of the show, you can go back and listen to it all on SoundCloud. Just search for The Throw-In. Also, you can keep up with everything we're doing on Facebook. Search for The Throw-In. Uh, and guys, we, we talked about it. It was a game last night at House Park, a game that, Kit, you were on the call for, which, by the way, I was in Houston last night. Go figure, did I go to the 4-4 draw between Sporting KC and Houston? No, instead I went to the game where they went nil-nil against uh, Colorado. But uh, I guess Colorado teams just have an issue scoring against Texas teams because the switchbacks uh, fall to the Aztecs 1-0. And Kit, I got to watch the broadcast last night. You guys do a fantastic job. It's a fantastic presentation. Uh, but Chris Tierpak, uh, the one goal in the eighth minute, and that was uh, that was it all night for the Aztecs. No, that's really all that it took. The Aztecs, Tierpak able to head a beautiful ball served in from Sandy Torre, just put it on the money. Tierpak able to slide that one past the goalkeeper. And Gork, he did a great job for Switchbacks FC. These two teams, the second time they've seen each other, both matches played here in Austin. They'll see each other four times this year. The next two, they will be up at Sand Creek Stadium in Colorado Springs. But this was a very important match for the Aztecs. They really needed the result. They didn't play as well as I think they would have liked. It wasn't the most attractive match, but all that really mattered was just three points. They were on their first losing streak as a professional franchise coming into last night, having dropped their last two. Cody Lorendi, a fantastic job for the man between the sticks. Defensively, the goalkeeper really came out, had some great saves. It was able to keep the clean sheet almost single-handedly at points. And now the Aztecs, six days until their next game, they host Oklahoma City Energy this coming Friday at home. And the goal is to build some momentum, hopefully get on a winning streak. Still very early, and speaking with Paul Doglish, the head man of the Aztecs after last night, he said it's early. We have a young team. We're still gelling. We're still trying to figure out the starting 11. And that's been part of the issue is that they haven't had the same starting 11 for any game so far this year. Still trying to figure out where the guys fit, how to put the pieces together. But slowly but surely, I think it's coming along. Well, they do need a gel, and that's exactly... Uh, you're correct, and they need a gel in the back line. That defense, I hate to say it, I, I want to use the word atrocious, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's been bad. The reason why they won last night is because of good goalkeeping, and it was fantastic goalkeeping. But credit to Torre. I really didn't think he was going to be the guy that was going to be giving an assist, right? And Tierpak, of course, Chrissy Tierpak, the speed, the pace, great finish. Yeah, goal sh- of the shout season. out to our man, Chris Tierpak. Nice enough to join us here, our friend on the throw in. And he just, I mean, he's a great guy. He's a local kid. He's from Dripping Springs. We all know his story. I mean, he's the most humble. He is down to earth, but he is a beast when you put him out on the pitch, able to finish it. Beautiful placement on the header. The one goal was all it took. Aztecs, they were able to weather the storm. But the question is defensively, as Justin mentioned, can the Aztecs, if they play other teams, if they play teams that are more potent offensively, I don't know if one goal is going to be enough. It wasn't against Los Dos because they scored late and they took a victory. And defense is kind of like the U.S. men's national team. Can they hold the lead when they get a lead? But again, like you said, early on the season, new team, young guys, first year as a real professional team, a lot of stuff to learn on the fly for the Austin Aztecs. Right, and I think psyche is very important for these guys trying to get the momentum, a young team, guys that are still trying to get adjusted, still trying to know each other. If they can start winning a few, if they can string one, two, three victories together, I think that will go a really long way to getting them into the playoffs. And really, that's the whole goal. If they can get into the playoffs, anything's possible. You know, guys, kind of a side note to this. Whenever I was looking at the game recap, uh, the first thing that popped up on Twitter for me was from the switchbacks. And this is the way that they described it in the second line. It says, in what was a warm and muggy night on the difficult field of House Park. And that struck me that in an official release from the switchbacks, they would say something critical about the field at House Park. And Kate, you've spoken with other coaches. Obviously, it is a football stadium. It's artificial turf, which isn't the most ideal thing in the world to play a soccer match on. But is this something that other USL teams have a problem with? Not that I've heard. And this is something that Colorado Springs switchbacks FC and their head coach, Steve Trichu, they've come out and they've said they've had an issue with this. Remember, this was the first game of the year for both of these teams, the Aztecs, that 2-0 victory over Colorado Springs to open the season. But coming into this saying, well, this is a narrow field, we're not used to playing on this, kind of like the Mexican FA talking about the pitch down there at the Alamo Dome. Both teams have to play on it. Maybe it's a bit of a home field advantage for the Aztecs, but that being said, really it doesn't make that big of a difference. I don't think that is a factor that decides the result. The Aztecs, well, everybody plays at home. Everyone has their own home field advantage. It's not an ideal situation but 
you can't fault the width of the pitch for losing a match. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but the person that put out that press release, I'm not going to call him a liar, but their, their facts were inaccurate. It was actually a beautiful evening last night at House Park. Austin's weather was fantastic, so I'm not sure if they have the, the correct information about the pitch. Let's be fair. <laughs> These are people who are coming down from Colorado, so what we view as a very mild and comfortable uh, April Texas true. evening might be rather warm and muggy. For them, as uh, you can hear the thunder outside. Yeah, but it worked uh, for the boys last night. They got the one vic- uh, one nil victory, and they'll be back in action on Friday night, not Saturday night, but on Friday night, and looking for another win at House Park. Yeah, you can second catch- game of a three game homestand. You can catch them in that third game of the homestand. Will be the following Wednesday night after that on May sixth, if I'm not mistaken, and that's also a night where they'll be uh, honoring veterans out there that night, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, they're going to be playing the all Air Force team. They've got some really cool looking camouflage jerseys, and I think they're going to be. Tra- trying to sell, raise some money for some very yep, worthy causes. But those are some really good-looking jerseys. I got a sneak peek of them last night. Very cool. So take a look at those. And two different options or chances to catch the Aztecs uh, up in the next two weeks, obviously, Friday night and then the following Wednesday night. Uh, as we're going to go ahead and uh, see if we can get in touch with our friends from the Austin Gunners, or Gooners as they like to be called, uh, to see what their preview is. So, Zach, let's go ahead and we're going to dial up our friends uh, over at the Tavern and see if we can get in touch with them. This reminds me of one of those Simpsons bits. Oh, it's Tavern. <laughs> you guys have a, a nickname for that we could give them for a fake name? or? Thank you for calling the Tavern. Oh. Okay, that's- Sports bar. Oh, are they going to... watch party or speak with us? <sighs> oh, quite That's disappointing. Yeah, I was very, expecting very something live. Zach, go ahead and get us through the menus, and then if you can get somebody live there, we'll come back to it. But uh, I was expecting to get someone at the bar. That's so sad. I wanted to talk to the head gooner. I know. That was, I mean, you know, we had, we had spoken about possibly giving them a call um, and got them back ago. to us. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. So to be fair, that was kind of poor planning on our half as well. To... But again, thanks to Jens Bush, he represented the Chelsea Blues and trying to get a little representation from the Arsenal, trying to be equal in our time that we give to different teams. Absolutely. Well, really quick, guys, what what's your prediction for this match between Arsenal and Chelsea? Oh, 2-1 Chelsea. All right. Oh, I, I high scoring three two Chelsea. I'm gonna go ahead and say three one Chelsea. So we'll see how that one comes away. Uh, you guys have match of the week for us Def- as we wrap this one yeah, up. Yeah, definitely so. It's Wednesday, Concacaf Champions League final, baby. Club America at Montreal. They have to play seven thousand two hundred feet below what they're used to playing. It's gonna mess with their sleep. It's gonna mess with their patterns. And I think Montreal. They might actually make history. We'll see. I Cl- hope Cl- you're right. I can't wait. It's going to be a fantastic match Wednesday night in Montreal. My match? Well, the battle of the Texas MLS teams Friday. Dallas and Houston, the Dynamo and FC Dallas. It'll be a really good one to see who can uh, take supremacy early here in the 2015 MLS season. Yeah, the the uh, FC Dallas has been in arguably some of the greatest form in the MLS so far early on in this season. Two words, Fabian Castillo. Oh, man, he has been outstanding for them for FC Dallas. Uh, and my match of the week, I'm going to have to go Wednesday night as well. But, Kit, it, it, am I not mistaken, is Chivas playing today? Is that is there a big match that's this afternoon? Oh, there is indeed a big Liga MX match. Chivas and America, the Clásico of Fútbol Mexicano. It's not like it used to be Chivas. Well, they're not the Chivas of old. But that being said, this, this rivalry never lacks any punch. And it should be a good one. Chivas is going to get up for a game, especially after falling in the Copa MX final to Cuauhtémoc Blanco's Puebla. It'll be today against America. Well, we're not going to have a chance to get in touch with our friends at the Austin Gunners, but we'll see if we can maybe get them on the show next week. Big thanks to all of you for joining us this week here on The Throw-In. A reminder, if you missed anything, you can catch it on SoundCloud. Search for The Throw-In. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at FC Cap City and check for us on Facebook. Uh, we are The Throw-In. Thanks for tuning in this Sunday. We'll catch you next Sunday at 9 here on The Throw-In on 104.9 The Horn, where Austin talks sports. We're diamond.